May we now call this meeting to order. To our visitors and friends, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will be your moderator for today's class. Welcome to another lecture given by members of the Springfield, Ohio Bible class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to sharing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of His eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as the result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, here in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Springfield branch was established in the year 1935. The president of our school here in Springfield is Dr. Rhonda Miller. Our vice president is Dr. Gurley Ramey. And our dean is Dr. Ronald Carr. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word of Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua and it has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. <coughs> Lord and God are titles, not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God. Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in any good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet which would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and of the Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in his pure spirit state, he is inscrutable and incomprehensible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, <coughs> took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, 
a super incorporeal being. That is, having the shape and form of a man, <coughs> excuse me, but without flesh and blood. This form may only be seen in divine vision and understood by divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know that name. So the simple, yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of his name and title may be obtained by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai where he showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school we show proof to how everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this divine threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary aims and objectives of the Bible class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, <clears throat> to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. <coughs> Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning, ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We will begin this morning with a prayer by Dr. Joseph Parts, a selection from the choir, and scripture by Dr. Dottie McNeil. Dr. Parts. <laughs> The 
Good morning, class. Good morning. Good morning. Let us bow in our hearts and minds for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father Yahweh, we are thankful to, that you have allowed us to assemble once again in your name. That you have allowed us to wake up this morning and come down here that we might further our understanding of you. We pray, Father, that you continue to strengthen us as the days go on and we near our end. Father, we want to thank you for your son. We want to thank for those who have preached the true gospel down through the ages, dispensations. We want to thank you for all things, Father, that you have given us and all the things that you have taken away from us that we might benefit and grow and be made fit for the body. Father, we thank you for all these things. And again, Father, we ask you that as the speaker come forth, that you speak through them. It's very important, Father, that you speak through them, that we might gain that understanding. And all this we ask in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say, Hallelujah.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will be reading 1 John, the fifth chapter. I'll be reading out of a Schofield Study Bible and serving the true and correct names. That's 1 John, the fifth chapter. Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh. And everyone that loveth him, that begot, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh, when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of Yahweh overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yahshua is the son of Yahweh? This is he that came by water and blood, even Yahshua the Messiah, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of Yahweh is greater, for this is the witness of Yahweh, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of Yahweh hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not Yahweh hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that Yahweh gave of his Son. And this is the record, that Yahweh hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of Yahweh hath not life. These things have I written unto you. Believe on the name of the Son of Yahweh, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of Yahweh. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Therefore, excuse me, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is no sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of Yahweh sinneth not, but he that is begotten of Yahweh keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are Yahweh, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of Yahweh is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Yahshua the Messiah. This is the true Elohim in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That was First John, the fifth chapter. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Parks, the New Jerusalem Singers, and Dr. Dottie McNeil. Before we call on our first speaker, I'd like to ask all class members to please silence any electronic devices or cell phones that you may have, so as not to disturb the speakers that come onto the floor. Thank you. And now at this time, it is an honor and a pleasure to call on for our first speaker. We'd like to call on Brother James Worthington. Say good morning to the class. Good morning. Good morning. First thing I'd like to say is, Dr. Ryan Carr said I'm going to be the second speaker. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate. <laughs> but 
first I'd like to say it's an honor and pleasure to stand before the assembly mm -hmm. and share those things with you that Joshua has shown me. Okay. Uh, a while back we were supposed to have, we had this chat and choose, yeah. and I was going to be one of the speakers. And I think a lot of members know that I kind of get into science. I've had, I have a love for science. It's not my profession, but I have a love for it. And so various members at different times have said, well, you need to get up on the floor and be honest with you, I'm too scared and apprehensive because I never felt like I was qualified to speak on the things of Yahweh and Yahshua. But I realized I would never be qualified, so I stand before you now. Now, I'd like to say, uh, there's been a couple of times, normally I wear uh, what they call walking leisure suits. And when I have no collar on, I look like a preacher. I was coming in one time, these two boys on a the bike, they're about 11 and 12, say, are you a preacher? I said, no. He said, well, you look like one. <laughs> I just kind of smiled and went inside. And then at my cousin Ruthie's funeral, I was a pallbearer, so I went up, I got a special place to park. And then they said, are you one of the preachers? I said, no. <laughs> he said, I'm just a pallbearer. He said, well, you look like one. So, but I just want to say, Joshua is the preacher and the teacher. That's right. That's right. That's right. But today, what I want to talk about is Yahweh Elohim being the archetype original pattern of the universe mm -hmm. and how everything goes by that pattern. Okay. Right. And so I'm going to start over here with this pattern that those that have been in class, you know, we've gone over a million times. But at any rate, you have the order of sin sacrifice, raising labor, you have the holy anointing oil that the high priest had to be anointed with before he'd go into the holy place. Then you have the seven branch candlestick, which was actually a, a lampstand. Sometimes they call it a lampstand because they had lamps on top and they poured oil into it. They had a table of showbread and the altar of incense that the priest had four ingredients. And I'm not going to try to say none of the names, but the four ingredients that the high priest would burn to give a fresh smell to Yahweh then you had the most holy place where you had the Ark of the Covenant, which had the Ten Commandments inside. You had the uh, Aaron's rod that budded and the uh, manna that was in the uh, gold, gold uh, vessel. And then on top, we had the uh, mercy seat that was like a lid. Right. And then we had the two archangels on top. And Yahweh was manifested in a cloud. On inside the tabernacle, on top of the tabernacle, and on the Day of Atonement, he would appear as the Shekinah, and that's what his eye is showing. Mm -hmm. And then um, the people would bring their sacrifices for their sins, and the priests would sacrifice them daily. They wash, wash them in the altar, and also the priests would wash their hands and feet before they, they could officiate in the holy place. And uh, once a year, and they, oh, they'd also eat the from the table of showbread. But once a year, the high priest would go into the most holy place for the sins of the congregation. And in the transcript of the Day of Atonement, Dr. Kelly said he would make a figure eight going in on the, on the right side, mm -hmm. come back around. He would do this three times, making which would be like three, three eights. <laughs> and on the chart over there, we had three eights on Joshua. Right, right. Because He's a new beginning for each age. And the satanic spirit, they have three sixes because he's short on each age. Now I'm going to go to this chart here. Where, okay, first I'd like to get um, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And uh, verse 1 through 4. First Corinthians 10 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was the Messiah. 
Okay, that's good. So a mystery has been shown to us since we've been in this class that Joshua was, was back here, and the world and the church world doesn't know that. Right. And so Joshua instructed Moses, and it says Yahweh told Moses to come up into the mountain, and he showed him the days of creation and this tabernacle pattern. And what we find, find out is that the days of creation that Moses saw each show a principle, a spiritual principle. And the first day, he divided the light from the darkness, and the light pointed to Yahweh, and the darkness pointed to the satanic spirit that was in the ethereal darkness. And the cosmic light pointed to Yahweh. Then we have the waters, divided the waters above from the waters beneath. And we know that the Yahweh is the living water. And that, but the waters beneath point to Joshua within us. So that is the water coming forth from us. And then on the third day, we have the seed of it. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. We have the seed of vegetation coming forth, showing the resurrection of Yahshua Messiah. Right. And then on the on the fourth day, we have the, the sun placed in the sky and the seasons of the year, which we always talk about the summertime is like glorification, the fall is like the death, mm -hmm. winter is a burial, mm -hmm. spring is a resurrection. And now I gave a paper to I think it's Dr. 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 McNeil, I'd like to, to read this. This is out of Elohim, but did you read the top? It's just a part that I highlighted. Elohim, the archetype, original pattern of the universe, volume one, page 65, the creation, the fourth day. Yahweh Elohim made two great lights, the sun and the moon, to give light upon the earth, and set them in the firmament as shown in the holy place, and most holy place. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night, as seen in the vision of the creation by Moses. We do know that Yahshua the Messiah, the son of Yahweh, was manifested in the earth in the end of the fourth day, or four thousand year. One day with Yahweh is a thousand years, Second Peter 3 and 8. As compared to the sun, being created on the fourth day as seen in Moses' vision of the creation. The sun which was manifest in the earth on the fourth day established a division between the seasons, according to the purpose of Yahweh, from darkness called night to light which is called day, as the son of Yahweh also manifested in the earth on the fourth day or four thousand years shown forth the division between unrighteousness and righteousness. The darkness extended back to the black chaos that covered the face of the deep in the beginning of creation, and the fall and death of the first man, Adam, who brought death or darkness upon all mankind. For in Adam all die. Even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15.22 the division of the law, which was by works, is typified by the moon, and the dispensation of grace, which is by faith, is typified by the sun with the Messiah, the true light or son married to his wife, the church, which is his body. This was revealed to John in Revelations 12 and 1, which reads, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, the church, clothed with the sun, the Messiah, and the moon, law, under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Thus, the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay. And, and the main thing I wanted to show from that is that the moon represented the dispensation of the law, mm -hmm. and the sun represented the dispensation of grace that we're right. in. And now we are clothed in the sun, which is Joshua the Messiah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I want to get into is, okay, in this school, we use the Bible, and we also use science, or the creation, because Yahweh is everything, and he manifests in the creation. So there's something in everything that we can see the principles of Yahweh. Whereas in the church world, and science, are like diametrically opposed to each other. But here in this class, we can use both of them, because the Bible shows the historical events that go by the pattern, whereas the creation or science shows the principle of Yahweh in science itself. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to get 1 John 5 and 7 and 8. 
which was the scripture lesson. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm going to get um, first, uh, first Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. First John 5, 7 and 8. For there, I'm sorry. Five, seven, eight. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay, now that shows the supernal nature of Yahweh, which is manifested in this tabernacle pattern, which is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, now could you read First Corinthians? First Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Yahshua died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, so... By these vessels here, they're showing the death, burial, and resurrection of the gospel Messiah. So the tabernacle pattern is showing the supernal nature of Yahweh with the most holy place, the holy place, and the court round about. And these vessels here show, are showing Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection. So in the creation part of it, I want to talk about the atom, the structure of the atom, the function of the atom, how, how, how it chemically bonds, and also, I want to talk a little bit about astronomy and the universe and a little bit on ecology. And those of you who don't know what ecology is, it's basically the living organisms on Earth. And ecology means house and how the organisms relate to each other and the Earth and the sun. Okay, but first I'm going to pull this right on. Okay, and it's quite frequently stated that the atom is a proton, a neutron, and electron. That's shown as the pro nature of Yahweh. <clears throat> but in actuality, there's not an atom that's a proton, neutron, and electron. The reason why I say that is because the first atom is a proton and electron. That's a hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. The next atom is a hydrogen atom. That's two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. But that's showing the atom in principle, the proton, neutron, and electron. Now the structure of the atom, I'm going to draw, I'm not going to draw the electron, I'm just going to draw the nucleus first. That's a proton. That's a neutron. Now, in particle physics, they have these giant scientific machines that they crash particles into each other. And they break them down to another level. So the proton And when they break it down, the proton is broken down into three particles, and the neutron breaks down into three particles. And these three particles, they call them quarks. Q U A R A S. Now the quarks, there's other type quarks too. But for some reason, they made these quarks, the up quarks and the down quarks. Now, the up quarks have a charge of plus two-thirds. That's the up quark. And the down quark has a charge of minus three. Now, that's in the proton. Now, in the neutron, you have one up quark, which is the plus three charge, and two down quarks, which are a minus charge. So what you do, if you add these charges up together, two-thirds and two-thirds will give you four-thirds. If you take away the one-third, you end up with a plus one. 
And that's the charge that the proton has. Now the neutron, you got two down quarks and you have one up quark, and so they nullify each other, so you have a charge of zero. And then the electron has a charge of minus, which is equal to the proton, but of the opposite polarity. Okay, now, another thing about the atom is it has up to seven energy orbitals. And Yahweh created this, and that seven points to perfection. Also, and that's called, <coughs> excuse me, that's called the electron cloud. Now, <coughs> now also, this atom, you have sub-levels. Now, the, the, the one level that we're normally used to looking at is the circular sub-level. Can I get the electron down here? And that this points to the quark round about. But you have three other sublevels. All together you have four sublevels. Dr. Rutherford, you can't see oh, on okay. this side. I did not that you just drew it. <laughs> you see it? Okay. That's okay, but I understand what you're saying. Okay. Okay, you have four sublevels. You have S orbital, P. D and F orbitals. This orbital is the one we normally see. It's circular or more like a sphere. It doesn't go around the Earth like a planet. It's more like on a sphere. If we find anyone in that sphere. <clears throat> These other orbitals make figure eights. Okay, the first, I know that, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> first suborbital can hold six electrons because it has three orientations like that. The D orbital has five orientations. It can hold ten electrons and the F orbital has seven. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to try to draw that. Okay, now the atom makes up the universe. So we have, I don't know what side to get on here, but I call them black, uh, right handed. Okay, in the universe, we have what we call nebula clouds. And if you Google a nebula cloud, it looks the same color as this fire right here. And out of the nebula cloud, stars are born. And so you have in this nebula cloud, you have three things. You have gravity, you have gas, mostly hydrogen, some helium, and you have dust. Showing the sperm nature of Yahweh. Now the gravity forces the hydrogen atom, fuses the hydrogen atoms together. And remember I said the hydrogen atom is just a proton and a neutron. It fuses them together. And once it fuses them together, then you have helium atoms. And so that's showing Yahweh Elohim coming forth from his invisibility. Because you can't get something out of nothing. In other words, you fuse the two hydrogen atoms together. Where does the, where does the neutron come from? It's in there, but you just can't see it. And that's also in the Elohim book. And Dr. Kelly talked about that, how that shows... Yahweh Elohim coming forth. Yeah. Now another thing is, at least I said that's black. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'm following along. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the closest star, which is the sun. And the sun is threefold. All right. Showing the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we just talked about what happens in the core where the gravity is forcing the hydrogen atoms together and forming the helium. And when it does that, it emits photons. So we have the core, then we have what's called a radiant zone where the photons are trying to make it to the surface. 
So you can you can liken the core to Yahweh, the radiant zone to Yahweh Elohim. And then on the last second you have what's called a convection. Convection uh, core. And what convection does is the gas heats up, goes to the surface, and it cools down and goes back around, making circular motion. And this circular motion is actually showing the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua and Messiah. Because everything in the universe rotates. The earth rotates, the galaxies rotate, the electron rotates, everything rotates. And you can liken that geometrical symbol to the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua and Messiah. Okay, now the sun, it also has a crown around it. Yeah. Okay. Now the sun has, there has to be something reflected in the mind the attributes of Yahweh. It's made of his body. So the sun has nine force, nine energy force carriers. The first one is gravity. next one is what they call SME, solar mass ejection. And that's when the sun emits particles or, or atoms that have been broken down, particles from it. And from that, that's when we get the auroras in the northern hemisphere because it magnetizes the atmosphere. And also it affects our satellites. A lot of times you have to shut the satellites down when you get a solar mass ejection. Now the other seven what's called the electronic spectrum of radiation, electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. And those are the seven lights that come from the sun. And those lights are, you got x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, radio waves, and microwaves. That gives you a total of nine energy carriers that affect our Earth. I'm still a little nervous. I'm, I'm, okay. A lot of stuff I was going to say that I already went out the window. It's like when I was walking to the grocery store with a list in my head. Everything's gone. <laughs> Somebody was writing it down. Oh. Somebody was writing it down. Write it down? Let me write it down again? You're going to have to go to YouTube. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> Gravity, solar mass ejection. X-rays. Okay. Gamma rays. Ultraviolet. Visible light. And infrared. Microwaves. Radio waves. And what I say, ultraviolet. That's ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. I think I looked that one out. See, X rays, gamma rays. That's it. Okay, I got it. Okay. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of <clears throat> ecology, which <laughs> that sounds like a big word, but it's not. Ecology is just a branch of biology that deals with living organisms and the earth and the sun relationship with each other. Yeah. Okay. So now, and one example of that is photosynthesis. Yeah. Okay. So now we have a plant. Not a very good flower. Look at my like dummy. <laughs> anyway, this this gumby, no, this plant <laughs> absorbs the photons, and it has pores that open and close, and these pores that open and close absorb carbon dioxide out of the air, CO2. 
Okay, and then it absorbs water from the earth, and then it combines the photons of carbon dioxide and water and creates what's called glucose or sugar, which is the food that the plant uses to survive on, and releases oxygen. So carbon dioxide, if you get put in a room with oxygen and breathe carbon dioxide, you're gonna die. So it's like a death. You have water with like a burial, then you have oxygen, which would be like a resurrection. Okay. Now, something else I wanted to show. Oh yeah, the, I talked about the structure of the atom, but I didn't talk about how, how that's one thing I forgot, I don't know, how it functions. And that's what uh, H2O, which is the chemical formula for water. If you look up H2O, it'll say water. What is, what is H2O? It'll say it's water. <coughs> and water takes the form of a solid, liquid and a gas. Okay, this is matter. You got H2O, which takes the form of ice, water, and steam or vapor. Now, well, water forms, it forms by what's called the octet rule of an atom. The octet rule is the rule of eight. And most atoms try to establish a stable configuration by having eight electrons around this outer orbital. And so the, the eight is a new beginning. And, and so we have Noah, they were eight in the ark. We have uh, the children of Israel where they had to be circumcised on the eighth day. And as I showed, the high priest going to the most holy place making a figure eight. Okay, now what happens is the oxygen atom has six electrons in its outer orbit. Can you see Teresa? Yes, sir. <laughs> no, I stand back with it. Okay. Yeah. This, this is oxygen. The hydrogen atom only has one electron. But the hydrogen and helium are the only atoms that contain two electrons in their outer orbital. So the hydrogen atom wants to get two electrons, whereas this oxygen atom wants to get eight. It only has six. So what happens is because that rule of eight, the hydrogen atom has one electron that loans or shares with this oxygen atom. And then you have the other hydrogen atom, it shares. Now, both of them have completed their outer orbital. orbital. Whereas this one has two electrons, it's full. This one has eight. And then that gives us a stable configuration. And most atoms try to establish that configuration of eight, which is showing a new beginning. I had a lot to say. I didn't think I was going to get through it, but I think I may get through it before I thought it was. Okay, now the next thing I want to talk about is the monarch butterfly. And, okay, the monarch butterfly, can we have an illustration over here? I'm going to stay up here. It's born, it comes out of the egg, it eats the egg, then it's crawls on the ground, it's bound to the ground. Right. Yeah. Just like Joshua came on earth. Yeah. And it's ugly for all intents and you know, purposes. And that keeps other predators from eating it. <laughs> so the mother butterfly lays the eggs on milkweed, which is poisonous mm -hmm. to other creatures. Mm, right. So what happens after the, the monarch butterfly eats and eats, it reaches a point where it's no longer going to eat anymore. It builds up the tree and hangs from a twig. And it spins silk and it hangs by its feet. Now what happens is it keeps getting bigger. As it gets bigger, its outer skin dies and then the, the uh, 
caterpillar sheds it, it does that four times. Each time it'll shed, and it'll be a bigger caterpillar inside. <clears throat> but on that fifth time, it sheds, there's a chrysalis inside. It forms a chrysalis, and a butterfly is inside the chrysalis. And so what happens is, eventually, it comes forth out of the chrysalis, and that's like showing a spiritual body, like Joshua raising from the dead. Right. Now, on that chart over there, it's also, it has a flower, and it has a sun. And the reason for that is the monarch butterfly eats nectar from the flower. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, it pollinates the flower also. Mm -hmm. And the flower, if you draw, see a picture of a flower, I don't think it's any better than that <laughs> Anyway, the flower has, it has an ovary. And then it has a male part. I'm not trying to be suggestive. It has a male part. It's called the stamen. And the anther is what produces the pollen. But the thing about it, it can't produce fruit, nuts, or seeds unless the pollen gets into the ovary. Mm -hmm. So we have bees, birds, flying creatures, butterflies. They go down to the flower to get the nectar, and then inadvertently, pollen gets inside and produces seeds or fruit or nuts and then it goes into fruition so that flying insect or bird is almost like a ministry spirit right, right. whereas it's bearing fruit just like Joshua once he enters into us then we bear fruit right the fruit of our lips yeah and he makes us king and priest and we offer spiritual sacrifices we don't offer physical sacrifices anymore Right. Now, another thing I'm going to talk about is the migration of the monarch butterfly. And this is amazing. Yeah. The, the monarch butterfly is, well, the word monarch suggests royalty or kingship yeah. or royal. Right. And it's a gold color with black trim around it. Mm -hmm. So the monarch butterfly. I was watching a documentary on it, and you have different generations of butterfly. I'm going to start with the fourth generation, and you'll see why it's going. Right. The fourth generation is born in Canada. So I'm going to draw, try to draw a picture of Canada and the United States. Okay, I'll just let this up. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. This is Canada, this is the United States, and this is Mexico. <laughs> Even though the, this is the new Canada, but it's after the flu. <laughs> anyway. Okay, the fourth generation butterfly is, is born in Canada. And at a certain time, and this modern butterfly lives for nine months, and it, and it calls it the super butterfly. And this is why. Because it migrates 2,000 miles from Canada to the United States and Mexico. Right. And it averages like 50 miles a day. <coughs> and for a little flimsy looking insect, you would think he'd better do that. When he gets out of the water, he just floats, he glides. And the scientists are amazed at it because they said, how can a butterfly born, never went anywhere before, know how to get to Mexico? <laughs> and so they said, either he's following the magnetic field around the earth, or he's following the sun. On that chart over there, they got a picture of the sun. And he's, he's following the angle of the sun. Yeah. And so there's one documentary I watched. They took some of these butterflies and they moved them over to the eastern part of the United States. Normally they come down to the western part. Mm -hmm. and these butterflies started down and then they turned back around <laughs> and went down this way. <laughs> they, they couldn't confuse them because they're right. following that sun. Right. Okay, so now what happens, this butterfly makes this 2,000 mile trip. He lives for nine months. He stays down in Mexico, and then they cluster together by the thousands on, this, on these trees yeah. to keep their bodies warm. And it's like a body of them. And they happen to be, for some reason, in 12 locations in Mexico. Wow. Now, what happens is, at a certain time, after, after they've been down there for five months, okay, this is the fourth generation right here. 
Now, this will live nine months. After five months, this fourth generation butterfly decides it's time to go back to Canada. Now, this is the fourth, now, he's a fourth generation coming down to Mexico. Mm -hmm. But on the way back, he's still alive. He's the first generation of those going back okay. to Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is this fourth generation butterfly, which is the first generation now on the way back, has a second generation butterfly. Mm -hmm. this, this one lives for two months. Okay? He's in the southern half of the United States. He lives for a month or two and produces another butterfly, which is the third generation. And he lives for a month or two. And he goes back to Canada. <coughs> and then his third generation produces the fourth generation butterfly. So it makes this monarch butterfly the first and the last. Showing Yashua Messiah, he's beginning and the end. It's the same butterfly. Because when I was watching this program, I said, where's this first generation? But they never talked about it and realized it was the same one. But the difference is he's, he's, he's going this way and then he's going back. Okay, so that's, that's showing Yashua the Messiah. Okay, now, what time is it? Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Now, another thing I'm going to talk about is an electrical circuit. An electrical circuit, you got to have a power source, which is like Ohio Edison or Dayton Power and like. You got to have a conduit. Which is the lines that come into your house. You got to have a way to deliver the energy to your house. Then you have a load. And so that's showing Yahweh, Yahweh Elam, and Yahshua. Okay. Now, if you take a rheostat switch, a rheostat switch, all it does, you know, when you lower and brighten the lights, is add more resistance to the circuit. And you have a three-four formula of I is equal to E over R. Why they use this, I don't know. The R stands for resistance. The E stands for volts, which I have no idea why they use the E. And the I stands for amperage, which is the current. So if you have 12 volts and you have 6 ohms, which is resistance, you'll end up with two amps of electricity. So now if you decrease this to three ohms, then you end up with four amps. And all I'm trying to say about this is the more we lose our carnal mind, which is resistance, the more Joshua will shine through us. Right. That's like the average. Yeah. Wow. And so this three-four formula, something sweat. Three-four <laughs> formula <laughs> is showing the Messiah in us. Okay, now. Take your time. All right. <laughs> Another thing I want to talk about is climate change. And climate change is the pollution of our air. We have pollution of air, water, and land. And that's showing the satanic spirit. Yeah. And the earth is in a state that they call homostasis, which means everything is functioning harmoniously. But when climate change is taking place, it's like the satanic spirit, where things don't operate <coughs> harmoniously anymore. And that's why you wonder why the weather is as wacky as it is. Right. Yeah. And what's happening is During the industrial age, we started burning fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels, we have inadvertently polluted our environment by putting CO2 into the atmosphere. And I've talked to a lot of people about this, and they say, well, that's just a natural occurrence. Well, it does happen naturally, but the scientists go to the Arctic areas and take out ice cores, and they say, no, there's way more carbon dioxide than it's supposed to be. So we realize that. Whether it's happening naturally or not, we have accelerated. Right. And so what happens is what makes 
the jet stream is the difference between the cold air and the hot air. You got jet stream in the middle. And as the temperature becomes closer to the same, the jet stream becomes weaker. Normally the jet stream is kind of like a wave. Mm -hmm. but now it's going like this. Yeah. You got hot air where it's supposed to be, cold air where it's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And what it's creating is natural disasters that happen more frequently, of a longer duration, and greater intensity. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get worse. Yeah. Because in the Arctic areas, which are warming up twice as fast as the rest of the planet, it's releasing methane. Mm. It's a ten times worse than carbon dioxide. Also, with the Arctic areas melting, you have more land is showing, and it's absorbing more heat. Also, the circulation of the ocean is slowing down. Mm -hmm. Because with the Arctic areas, Arctic areas melting, the Arctic is fresh water, and the ocean is salt water. Yeah. So the fresh water is diluting the salt content. Mm -hmm. Normally what happens when the water comes from the equator, the warm water comes up, it gets cold and the salt condenses and it drops back down. But since the ocean conveyor belt is slowing down, <laughs> this what it, it brings up the Arctic, the tropical air, and now that it's, it's creating our weather changes. It's creating what they call atmospheric rivers. We have droughts in some places, and we have uh, uh, floods in other areas. Okay, oh, another thing that completely escaped my mind, I'm going to talk about it real quick. Starting to pound down a little bit. <laughs> I was supposed to talk about this a long time ago. I'm going to talk about how the earth, how the earth is structured by this tabernacle pattern. Now if you look at the earth, the earth has longitude, lat, lat, latitude, longitude lines, which form a great work. Yeah. And we, even though the earth is around, we say north, south, east, and west, and we use the expression four corners of the earth. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, we got water, and we energize all of our equipment by fossil fuels. And also, because we have food, <coughs> then you have light from the sun, which manifests in seven colors. You have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Then you have the atmosphere, which is made from four main components of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. <coughs> and then we have the sun, which is basically hydrogen and helium. And it sends four photons to the earth and sustains our life. And at this time, I think I, there's a lot of things I was going to say, and it's completely escaped my mind, but I just want to get up and share that with you so that to increase our faith and give yeah. us consolation in this gospel yeah. that is true because you can't go anywhere else in the world and even hear anything close to this. Right. It's not me, it's Joshua in me right. that is showing it to me. Right. And I, did, I haven't gotten up before because I feel like a computer we have to defragment it. People know what computer that's on my brain. It's fragmented. And I thought I had it lined up pretty well how I was going to express it, but it didn't quite come out that way. But nevertheless, I, I want to thank Dr. Carr for allowing me to stand up. And hopefully, you are edified with what was said. With that, we would like to hear, I'd like to hear some more in the future. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to escape.
call you Dr. Worthy. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Worthy. That was, that was very good. Very enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. And now at this time, it is an honor and a pleasure to call on for our second speaker. We'd like to call on Dr. Rosemary Turner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, it's clean. Okay, <laughs> don't know the drill. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I just want to say that was beautiful. Yes. What Yahshua gave you to share with the rest of us. And my prayer to Yahweh is that he'll speak through all the teachers. Uh, it, it's beautiful. What, what came through him shows the excellency of Yahshua. Yes. And it's the emphasis. You know, we, we sit in here and we hear about the death, burial, resurrection. Well, let's get 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 through 4. And then uh, what he's talking about is this divine, divine pattern of the universe, mm -hmm. which is Yahweh Elohim. He is the archetype, which means original pattern of the universe. And how y Yahweh, like the moderator went over, he's, this cloud on this chart shows it goes all around the edges, like the moderator says, and it shows that everything on this chart abides within this cloud as everything in the universe abides within Yahweh. And Yahweh knew that we could not see him. We can't, we can't see his attributes, intelligence. They're not something tangible. These are invisible attributes, divine, intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, beauty, love and justice, foundation, power and strength. And I used to hear Dr. Kinley say that this is inorganic, mm -hmm. which means it's not, it, this, you, can't, you can't detect mm -hmm. Yahweh with your senses, mm -hmm. how he is, and he created us, he knows we can't do that. So what he did was he came forth in a set position, these attributes lined up in a particular <coughs> fashion See, and this is Yahweh Elohim. It's not something different. This is Yahweh in shape and form, invisible. See, and that's what uh, Dr. Worthington was talking about, how Yahweh is manifesting in the whole creation. We learn about this when we come to class, how that Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders here gather uh, on this plateau. They saw a vision of Elohim in incorporeal form. And that's Exodus 24, 9, and 10. But first, let's read 1 Corinthians 15. I really enjoyed that because I too, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I really love that kind of stuff in school. Yeah. I, and I didn't know why. And I, when I was young, coming down to the class building, I listened to, and they said, everything's threefold. And I didn't have a clue why. I asked Leah, I said, why is everything threefold? She said, it's showing forth Yahweh's supernal nature. But I didn't know what that was. But then I noticed in school, everything was threefold when you got to the sciences. And I did real good in science. I got A's. <laughs> because of coming to this class and applying those principles. See? And I, I remember uh, Dr. Gill was reading about, in first, is it in 1 Corinthians, what is it, earthly? The terrestrial is the earthly, and the celestial is the heavenly. Right. So we had this, this question on the test about you had to pick one animal that matched the, the, v, the genus and species would name. Mm -hmm. That's a two-name system that scientists put together to identify the animals and the plants. Mm -hmm. And this one said Lubricus terrestris. And I, I, don't, I, I looked down there, the earthworm was down there. I said, it's got to be the earthworm. <laughs> and it was. And I learned that down at this school. See, I, you know, I said, it helps you in your whole life. But it made me look more seriously when I came to class at what was being said. This teaching is not from a man. This teaching is not from 
Henry Clifford Kinley. This teaching is from Yahshua the Messiah, and he revealed it to him. Let's uh, get 1 Corinthians 15, and then I want to go to Habakkuk. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Uh -huh. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel um, which I preached unto you, right. which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, mm -hmm. unless you have believed in vain. Right. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now, Paul was a smart man, but he said, I didn't come up with this. I received it. Mm -hmm. right. Remember when he's on his road to Damascus, and he was knocked down, he was struck blind. He's, he encountered, he had an experience with Yahshua the Messiah, yeah. and he was converted, mm -hmm. see, yeah. after that. This is what he's received. Go okay, ahead, read on. That which I also received, uh, how that the Messiah died for our sins. How? According. In what manner? Mm -hmm. How Yahshua died for our, for our sins. He didn't just die. He died for our sins. Read on. According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. What's written in the law and the prophets, which is displayed on these charts. How he died for our sins. Not any old kind of way, but according to the law and the prophets. Read on. And that he was buried, mm -hmm. and that he rose again the third day. Why is he saying it like that? Death, burial, read on, and he rose, resurrection. Rose, rose again the third day according to the, the scriptures. The third day, too, according yeah. to the scriptures, just like uh, he was talking about the third day, how the seed of vegetation came forth. It had to show that resurrection on the third day, because it's pointing to Yahshua. Now, this information we have, or this knowledge, came from the Holy Spirit, and Yahweh foreordained that we would have this. Mm -hmm. He knew from the beginning. He had a purpose and a plan. Yeah. But this is the chart on the pattern or plan of salvation. Yahweh planned it out from the very beginning that he would deliver salvation to, to some of his <laughs> creatures. See, yeah. And so that would necessitate a vision, a divine vision. Because we didn't know anything. We use our imaginations and we just come up wrong all the time. Did you ever see the little rascals? Yeah. And they asked them to bake a cake. And these little kids were putting all kind of stuff in this bowl. Even objects like glasses and a camera, mousetrap. And they were stirring it all. They didn't know what they were doing. They thought they were making a cake. They made something all right. I mean, one of them took a bite and the mouse cut got on his lip. <laughs> but see, that's how we are about the Bible. Yes. We don't want to have an understanding with our natural mind. We're just like little kids. Yeah. And you just talk to a kid and say, okay, how do, you, how do you paint a house? And they'll come up with some elaborate stuff like they're giving you facts. <laughs> and they don't know. They're just using their imagination. Yeah. But see, that's, these are images that we have. Right. Uh, theories and opinions that we come in with. We come into the world not knowing where we came from. We don't, I don't remember being born to you. No. <laughs> no. I, the, my earliest memory I, is standing up in a crib because I had a stomach ache. And Mama was laying on the bed. And I got sick over the side of the crib. That's my earliest memory. You know, some people remember other stuff. But, you know, we didn't know squat when we came in here. So Yahweh knew this, and he prepared a vision, a divine vision and revelation. He foreordained it. See, oh, it talks about predestination in Ephesians, the first chapter. Yahweh foreordained this. See, this is a beautiful thing to come into this teaching. Now, uh, get Habakkuk, go, you can do 1 and 5 and then go to 2 and 1. Habakkuk, 1 and 5. Uh-huh. Behold ye among the heathen, yes. and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told. See, we didn't believe the work that Yahshua did because we didn't know his name. We didn't know not only his name, we didn't know his mission. We thought we had to just copycat what he did. You know, that's what the church has come up with, dragging these carnal ordinances, some of them, not all of them, 
You know, they're not going to go to church and offer up a bullock. <laughs> they won't even fry you a hamburger. It's, I mean, it's expensive. You see, this, this, they're dragging over parts of this, uh, dragging it over into the present age, uh, totally disannulling what Yahshua has done because they don't know what he's done. See, they, it, I've always heard Jesus died for you. And I never... I didn't understand none of that. And I didn't realize they didn't understand it either. So Yahweh prepared a divine vision and revelation for us at the end of this age. Uh, go ahead and read Habakkuk 2 and 1. Habakkuk 2 and 1. And this is, you know, when you look at the Bible and you look at what's written in the law and the prophets, these prophets spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> That's 2 Peter 1 8, 119. Let's get that, hold your finger on there. Get. I remember somebody who was in class the other day, and Dr. Lewis was reading scriptures. He had his fingers all stuck in the Bible. <laughs> they kept saying, hold this, hold this. <laughs> and that's what, and that his fingers was all jammed in that Bible. <laughs> that's how it is. Okay, go ahead. You want Second Peter? Yes, please, Second, Second Peter. Second Peter 1 and 19. Uh -huh. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Right. Whereunto you do well. Well, you might as well start up at 16. 16. Yeah. yeah, just for some continuity. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we make known unto you the power and coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. All right. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he's referring to what's depicted on this chart at the Mount of Transfiguration. That's right. Because you had Peter the elder, and James and John, which are brothers, on this mountain, and they had a vision of Yahshua, see? And, and that's, a, that's a fulfillment of Aaron, who is the eldest, Nadab and Abihu, who, who are brothers, and they had a vision of Yahweh Elohim. He's fulfilling that. Okay, read on, please. For he received from Elohim, the yeah. Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Yes. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Because Peter said, let's make three tabernacles. Now, why did he even mention the tabernacle? Because it's in fulfillment of what they saw here. They saw Yahweh Elohim, who is the, the tabernacle. This tabernacle is intangible. It's a breakdown of Yahweh Elohim. So Peter, not understanding... You know, so let's make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Yahshua. You know. Okay, read on, read on. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Yes. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Right. Whereunto you do well that you take heed. You do well that you take heed to it. And that's what, oh, we do well if we take heed. Read right. on. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place, mm -hmm. until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Now this is the day star from a physical standpoint, like Jimmy was talking about, the sun, the S-U-N. But the true day star is Yahweh Elohim. He is the S-O-N. He's That's Yahweh, the archetype pattern of the universe right here. See, And he's manifested into the whole creation. Okay, uh, let's go back to Habakkuk 2. I will stand upon my watch. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk 2 and 1. I will stand upon my watch yes. and set me upon the tower. Yes. It will watch to see what he will say unto and me. And you know, the more you come down to this class and you, you learn about types and shadows and allegories that are in the Bible, those were, these are mysteries. And our theme song is Romans 1, 19 and 20. Let's read that. I don't want to try to get everywhere, but, you know, just to call to all our remembrance that these things that are written in the scriptures, they're a lot, they're, you, a lot of times you can't take it literally. There's a type and a shadow. Right. And when Habakkuk said, I will stand upon my watch right. and set me upon the tower, that's showing elevation. Right. From a physical standpoint, but he's talking about elevation in our hearts and in our minds. Right. I will stand upon my watch. Read Romans, and then we'll go back to Habakkuk, please. Romans 1 and 19. Mm -hmm. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. That's glorious that we can know something about Yahweh. Have you been to ever visited a church and they'll say you're meddling in God's business? Yeah. And people, friends will tell you, you can't really know. 
about God. That's what they'll tell you because they don't know and everybody they talk to didn't know, so they figure nobody knows. And nobody did know until this vision we're going to talk about. Okay, read on. I was. For Yahweh had shown it unto Yes. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And these invisible attributes, those are some of the things that are invisible. Angels are invisible. You know, when. when uh, I, I'm going to call you Dr. Worthington. When he was talking about the pollination and how the bees, you ever watch that movie, the bee movie? It's a cartoon, but it's got a good message about how the bees are disappearing. Yeah. And if you don't have bees, you're not going to have pollination and you're not going to have fruition. You know, we got to have, it's, that's part of that uh, Ecology, you were talking about. We, you, we're, it's necessary, and it's interesting because bees and and like you said, though, there's they're winged creatures. See, and there was winged creatures on the walls of this tabernacle, representing the angels. See, in heaven, they're winged creatures, and certain times of the year, I always noticed in the month of September, we used to get a lot of bees. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, what's with all these bees here? But it was it was on the tabernacle, right. right where the veil was. Yep. See? I always start with December, January, February. March is on the veil. Uh -huh. And April. And May is on the veil. June, July, August, in the most holy place. Right. September is on that veil. Yeah. Right. And I see all these bees coming out at September. And, you know, that... October is in the holy place, November is on the veil, then you go back into the court roundabout. Yeah. All the months of the year, the seasons line up That's with right. that tabernacle. Yeah. You, when you look at it that way, you never look at the months like you used to. Yeah. Right. That's See, right. Uh, let me go to Habakkuk before I mess up. Did you finish Romans? No. Finish yes, please. <laughs> For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and supernal nature. Even Yahweh's eternal power and his makeup, his supernal nature. Yahweh, with the, he's the source and substance, limits and bounds of everything, like it shows on the green chart. You see, Yahweh manifested in this intangible form. It's Yahweh it's anthropomorphic, see, shape and form of a man, but we didn't, we're not, he's not like us, we're like him. <laughs> Shape and form. That's like when somebody says, you know, you look just like a Ruby Jackson. <laughs> and you know, see, she's, yeah, you do look like her because that's your mother. But she don't look like you. She's the source. You know, <laughs> we, get, we get it twisted sometimes. You see, Yahweh Elohim. And see, and then uh, Yahshua manifested. He manifested in flesh, back as flesh, back here with Moses. As Yahshua, the son of Nun, that was a great mystery that we had never heard before coming to this class. And then we found out that Yahshua, the Messiah, was not God's little boy that came down here and had a short lifespan. That was Yahweh in, in that sacrificial body coming in for a purpose. See, I tell you, before you come into this class, you don't, not only do you not know his name, you don't understand his mission. And you do the wrong thing trying to be right yeah. by dragging these things over. You know, you, I used to think, even when I was a youngster coming here, I thought, well, what's so wrong about doing these? You know, because I was asking Yahshua to show me, but I didn't understand that it's a slap in Yahshua's face to say, I need to do this to save myself. See, when it wasn't even given to a Gentile in the first place, right. not only is it not given to a Gentile, the Jews don't have it now in this present kingdom age. Right. We really need to understand what time it is right. and where we are in time. Now, did I let you finally finish Romans? Okay, and let's <laughs> go to, where did I have you going? Rebecca 2. Oh, thank you. Rebecca 2 and 1. I will stand upon my watch yes. and set me upon the tower. Yes. And I will watch to see what he shall say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And this is important. Read on. And Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables. That's so confusing when you don't know. Write the vision, see? Yeah. And make it plain upon tables. Here, here 
it is before us, folks. Playing on tables. Yeah. This vision that Habakkuk was talking about as a prophet had this is what this vision coming in at the end of this age that was given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the year of 1931. That's what he was talking about. That's what Yahweh had foreordained for us, and it's in everybody's Bible. Mm. Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, read on. That he may run that readeth it. That he may run that readeth it, see, read on. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. He's talking the vision, telling Habakkuk, the vision is not now, it's yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. And he said this vision was going to come in at the end. At the end of this present kingdom age. We've learned down here that, see how this fiery cloud is on here? This is symbolic again of Yahweh or pure spirit. And time that Yahweh created for man abides within this. There are seven ages and seven dispensations Dispensation means the divine ordering of the affairs of man by Yahweh, because we don't know how to order our affairs. See, we don't know what's pleasing to Yahweh. Let me move this a little bit over. See, we don't understand, but Yahweh, this, this first age, the creative age, that was spiritual. That was in the spirit. Angelic, he created the angel. Angelic, and see this dotted line? He also created the physical creation, see? Now, here, the first actual physical age we have is the second age, <laughs> or the antediluvian age, which means before the flood, before the deluge. This is the antediluvian age, and that's with Adam, in the, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then it ends with the flood, with Noah. See, that's the end of that age. Then you've got the, the third age, which is also in the physical, the post-Diluvian age. That's the age after the flood. And you'll see that you've got all these covenants. Oh, there's a lot going on in this age. That's when you've got the law which was imposed on Israel in this, in this, second, in this third age. And see, when you get to this cross, that's showing the death of Yahshua the Messiah. It was the end. It doesn't mean it's the end of Yahshua. It means the end that he fulfilled what was written in the Law and the Prophets. Yeah. And Hebrews 9 and 26, but started 9 and 24. Because mm -hmm. we never knew this before. Mm -hmm. Yahweh's got it all mapped up according to his purpose and plan. Mm -hmm. He's got it all laid out for us. He had us in mind right. and then he brought us into this teaching mm -hmm. so that we can learn about him so that we can be saved yeah. that's so beautiful yeah. and it's yeah. it's displayed on these charts it's displayed in the creation as we just heard in meticulous detail right. it's yeah. displayed in our bodies you got i got parts we got parts we don't even know about right. <laughs> we got parts in our body we ain't never heard of. Because <laughs> we're, you know, we're not educated. We're just born walking around here eating sandwiches. <laughs> but then, yeah, well, that's what we educated these doctors. See, you're, you're blessed if you get a good doctor. But Yahweh gave them the knowledge that they have. And they were in those books. They're studying for I don't know how many hours a day. and practicing medicine and for our benefit and Yahweh put him here for that. Sometimes you get a one that's not so good. We barely made it out of medical school. But you just have to you have to discern. Okay, you got ready with Hebrews. Hebrews nine and twenty four. Thank you. For Yahshua is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Now when he's talking about the holy places made with hands, look at this tabernacle. Boy, I don't want to tear the charts up. Oh, let me. I was scooting this around wrong. I'll look at the tabernacle. That's a, a holy place made with hands, which yeah. Yahweh gave uh, the the instructions for that tabernacle to Moses, and he he uh, conveyed that to the Israelites. You know, he and Yahweh put His Spirit like in Oholiab and some of those other guys. He gave women. 
the, the spirit to know about embroidery and all this stuff so they could construct this tabernacle. Right. See, this tabernacle is threefold. Most holy place, holy place, court round about. And like he went through the, the, the vessels in this tabernacle, this tabernacle has not only a structure, but it has a function. There's a high pre priest and two low priests that operated in this tabernacle here. Right. See, so that's what happened. That's what he said. Yahshua, read that again. What you said about Yahshua? For Yahshua is not entered into the holy places made with hands, right? Which are the figures of the true. And see, Yahshua was the true high priest, but yeah. he's not talking about operating in holy places made with hands. Read on. Which are the figures? That's that type and shadow again. Figures of the true. Read on. But into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of Yahweh. But in the, now this high priest would appear in the most holy place before this Ark of the Covenant, before Yahweh, and he had those those onyxes on his shoulder with the names of the tribes yeah. engraved in them. Yeah. See, that's showing the priest. He he represents Yahshua standing before Yahweh for the benefit of the people. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And see, and Yahshua is in, appearing in heaven now for us. Yeah. That's what he's done for us. And we can know that using Romans 1, 19 and 20. Somebody said, how do you know? I used to, I remember asking Dr. Gill, how do you know Yahweh had nine attributes? And he told me it has to be revealed. And it's revealed through the creation. Every time you see that nine, just like we were going over the nine systems in your body, the nine planets in, in our solar system, the, all the, uh, that's, Pointing to the supernal nature of Yahweh, that's how you know. That's how that confirms it for you and gives you faith. Right. See, that's yeah. how he, he takes the, just like I almost let you finish it in Romans, it takes the natural yeah. to understand the spiritual. That's Yahweh's rule. That's right. That's Yahweh's rule. Just like gravity when he's talking about if you jump off of a cliff, your conclusion is going to be a flat out on the ground somewhere. That's just law. That's law. And see, these principles laid down in the, in the creation. Oh, boy. Well, let me finish over here with Hebrews. Hebrews 9 and 25. Thanks. Nor yet that he should offer himself often right. as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with blood of others. See, that high priest did that every year. He said, not yet, nor yet that Joshua should do that often. Mm -hmm. Read on. For then must he often have suffered right. since the foundation of the world. Right. But now once in the end of the world. Here we go. End. Now once in the end of this age or world. Read. Right. Have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of by himself. By the sacrifice of himself. Mm -hmm. See. And is there more there? And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So see so he offered up. That was that sacrificial body that was nailed to the cross right. according to the pattern. See, but he that was the end, not, not the end of Yahshua, because here we are in the fourth age or the present kingdom age in which we live. See, Yahweh had us in mind, don't tell you. He poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, first to the Jews, and then seven years later to the Gentiles. And it's up, you look at this chart, the Cardinal Ornish chart, mm -hmm. and it says, promise fulfilled. Yeah. Right. And you've got, that's the Jews coming in. Then seven years later, he brought in the Gentiles. Right. Same Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that was the answer to the promise that he made to Abraham, where he said he was going to bless not just the Jews, all. but all families of the earth. Right. And when Yahweh had Moses out here at the burning bush, and he gave him his name. He said, this is my name forever. And this is my memorial, not just to the Jews, to all generations. So all of us need to call him by his name, right. Yahweh. Right. People don't want to hear it. Right. When you say Yahweh, they get nervous. Yeah. See? Yeah. You know yeah. why? Because this old boy has got yeah. control. Yeah. They don't want to hear about Yahweh. But Yahweh is the true name, sacred name of our Heavenly Father. Right. And Yahshua the Messiah means Yahweh is salvation. Uh, do I have you holding anything else? Get Matthew 121. See, I'll tell you, it's important. It's important. 
Now, I, and you know, we had a, a mixed multitude at my sister-in-law's memorial, and Betty Jo was running it, and she sang a beautiful song, and she used Yahshua in the song. And everybody just, you know, some people just rolled over them. I, you know, maybe Yahweh will touch somebody. Yeah. Don't be afraid to use the true name about people who don't know, because all of us had a first time coming right. down this yeah. class. Right. And this yeah. is for all, all people, right. all right. generations, see? Right. Yeah. That's what this teaching is for. It's not just for us, mm -hmm. our little group. Right. See? Right. This is, uh, that's why Dr. Kinley brought up ministers, mm -hmm. because he wanted this to be taught in, all through the world. This is why when he had the conventions going on, he selected cities that, where there was not a class. Mm -hmm because he wanted to draw in the new people yeah. and, and share with them right. so that somebody might have an interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, we, he had this meeting downtown at, uh, I forget, in, at Wittenberg. We had a, he had a meeting, Reconciliation of the Ministry. Yeah. 1971. Yeah, 1971. And everybody, people were invited. It was in the paper. He, they sent letters to the ministers all around inviting them to come. I think there was only one lady who came, uh, that Grace Hunt, she was a minister. She came. But she said she was more comfortable with Jesus. Yeah. But see, that's, you know, that's, that's too bad because Jesus, that's, that's impossible rendering of the true name of our Savior. Yeah. Yahshua, if you get Matthew 121, just read that. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua. Yes. For he shall save his people from their sins. He's explaining what it means. Right. He shall call his name Yahshua. Is there a colon there? There's a colon, there's right. a colon there, yeah. which means what follows explains what's before. That's right. And this is an angel. Yeah. See, Yah and he's Yahweh's messenger. So uh, he, they're not going to just come out and say what they want to say. These angels, they're Yahweh's ministers. Okay. He's saying what Yahweh told him to say. She shall call his name Yahshua, colon, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. And that's where that came from, straight from Yahweh. One of our aims, is it the ninth aim? Mm -hmm. To make known to Yahweh. Yes. And you know, these aims were written by the founder of this school who had the divine vision and revelation mm -hmm. under the influence of the Holy Spirit is how these aims came about. Right. None of this stuff is, is just something thrown out there. This all came from Yahweh. All right. All right. All right. If you read that ninth aim. Ninth aim. To make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name right. given among men whereby man can be saved. And Dr. Gill used to say, do you know what no other name means? <laughs> you can't call him anything else. You can't call him Henry C. Kinley. Dr. Kinley told you that. Many transcripts of lectures that he gave, and you know, that's like in a courtroom, they take transcripts of what's being said. And this is coming straight from the founder who received the divine vision and revelation. He said, I am not your savior. Right. He wasn't trying to be modest. He was telling you the facts. Because, and he said in one transcript, if you keep going like this, you know, praising him, you're going to go straight to the lake. That's right. He's warning us. Don't yeah. do that. And I can see the attraction. I used to want to be around the founder a lot because yeah. of what the wisdom and knowledge he was giving out. And I got confused at some point. I thought... There's something to him. But what was in him was what had to be in us. Mm. Yeah. You know, Yahshua the Messiah. That's the point. And the reason he knew is because he did receive this, uh, this divine vision that Habakkuk is talking about that was foreordained in the Bible. It's in the Bible. This vision is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. This is foreordained for us. And we're blessed yeah. down here at the end of the age. When you look at this, yeah. we're in this present kingdom age, and everything is, oh boy, it's wrapping up. Mm -hmm. You've got people, you've got people killing people at the drop of a hat. Yeah. If you look at them funny, they shoot you. Yeah. I think somebody here in the class had a gun pulled on them. Got the traffic light. 
not too long ago. See, you just have to get away. You have to, you have to call on Yahshua yeah. because we're down here right. at the end, yeah. and at the end it says revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. Second Thessalonians one six through eight. Let's read that, and then you'll say, well, what's next? Now. We're going to go into the fifth age, and this is not a physical age. This is spirit. This is says immortality. Yeah. That means no flesh, no no flesh and blood. Different from this, no physical. The whole Yahweh's going to take out the whole physical creation. He's going to take. He's wrapping it up. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it yeah. says it's going to be rolled together as a scroll. Mm -hmm. Somewhere back there in Isaiah, I forget the verse, but it said he's going to roll it all together as a throw, as a scroll. And in 2 Peter 3 and 8, do I have you getting something else? I have a bad habit of doing that. 2 Thessalonians. Okay, let's get 2 Thessalonians, then get 2 Peter 3. And really started like, well, 8 is good. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 6. Uh -huh. Seeing it is a righteous thing with Yahweh Elohim to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Right, you don't fight. <laughs> he did not tell you to go out and box with somebody. <laughs> Yahweh will take care of it. People, it's not going to be smooth like Dr. Kerr told me, and it helped me. Things are not going to go smooth. See, it's going to be rough, right? Yeah. See, go ahead, read. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Rest with us. That's the rest up here between your ears. Rest. That's where the turmoil is. Read on. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. With his mighty angels. And There's somewhere back in the scriptures where uh, they, were, they were going to fight somebody. And, Yah, and the prophet said, Yahweh, open his eyes so he can see. That's right. You know, because it looked like they were a little puny group against a great big army. And then when he opened his eyes, he saw the angels in the chariots. He saw who was fighting for him. Then he's like, oh, let's do this. <laughs> and see, that's what we got. We've got the angels. Dr. Kimmel used to say that angels come to this class. Right, right. You know, I would know many times the choir would get up and the angels would be singing with us. And I'd say they didn't come to rehearsal. They didn't come to rehearsal. <laughs> but those voices, you could tell it was the angelic. See? It wasn't us. We y'all would let us know it wasn't us. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Would I have you old? Uh, when when Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven yes. with his mighty angels, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. In flaming fire, and he's going to be taking vengeance on those that don't know Yahweh and, and that obey not the gospel of our Savior, Yahshua They the don't Messiah. obey the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. See, you're disobedient to this. This pattern, where is it in the uh, Truth About Pollution where he talks about the loss of this pattern? One of these pamphlets, and I tell you, one of these, these pamphlets are powerful. Oh, yeah. They're teaching aids. But one of these pamphlets that talks about how the loss of this pattern mm -hmm. is like the destruction is devastating to the world. Mm -hmm. They've lost it. You know, at a time when Israel, after they were over in Canaan land and years later, they, they quit practicing under the law. Yeah. They quit, they, one of them found the book of the yeah. law when they were yeah. fixing up the temple. And the king is like, you're, we're supposed to be doing this and we're not doing it? <laughs> so you know, Yahweh can let the devil lead you on astray. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're a lost ball in high weeds. Yeah. See? But he'll bring it back to you. It's, we're, that's why we're so blessed. That's right. See, I know I didn't deserve any of this. I didn't deserve it, to learn anything to, to be here. I didn't deserve any of it. And neither did you. No. See? And that's, that's right. we got to come to that. And then realize we're so blessed. Okay, do I have you holding something else? Um, second Peter 3 and 8. Yes, thank you. <laughs> second Peter 3 and And this is not to scare anybody, but it is. There was a show called Scared Straight that used yeah. to come yeah. on. Yeah. And they'd take these little young whippersnappers that thought they were so bad and throw them in, in the pen with some hardened criminals. Yeah. And they were scared straight. Yeah. 
They realize what it be, was to be really in the pen. And see, Yahweh scares, shakes us up sometimes. So we'll know how serious this is because there is a lake. Oh, man. I need some spinach. <laughs> like Popeye, get some muscles. <laughs> it's okay. And there is a lake of fire. And Yahweh made this lake to be inhabited. Right. See, he's, it's just not a, something to scare you with. It's, this is what we're coming down to is the culmination of this whole thing. And you're either going to be in Yahshua the Messiah safe or you're going to be in the lake mm -hmm. of fire yeah. uh, forever. It's not like a bad dream where you wake up and, ooh, that was over. No, won't, you right. won't wake up from it. See, and we don't, I don't want that for me or anybody else. And over here in Peter, what's he saying about this? Second Peter 3 and 8. Mm -hmm. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, yes. and a thousand years as one day. See, and look, when he said one day is a thousand years, well, you can imagine dispensation church. Each one of these ages is approximately 2,000 years. That's okay. The approximately 2,000 years. So one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years. So each one of these ages is approximately two days. That's why he says we're in the last days. We're in this final age, physical age, before we go into immortality. See, that's what's next. There's more. <laughs> when this is over, you know, a lot of people are despondent and they'll take their own life and they think they're ending their troubles. But it's just getting started. You're in the age of immortality. Your soul lives on. Your soul is going to be aware of where you are. See, that we got, and then the sixth and seventh age are ages to come, also in immortality. See, day of eternity. We're, you know, we still will, we still will exist. That's right. We still will exist, but we got to be careful and conscientious of that and prayerful to Yahweh to keep us in this teaching. Okay, go ahead and read. Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise. Right. As some men count slackness, mm -hmm. but is long suffering toward us. He's, oh, is he ever yeah. long suffering toward us? Yeah. Just like when you were a t rowdy teenager and your parents were long suffering towards you. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them don't boot you out. <laughs> Sometimes the kids get so wild, they say, You got to go. Yeah. You know, because they're physical people too, and it wears them down, wears their health down. If you have an unruly teenager, see, but Yahweh is long suffering to us. Word, read on. Not willing that any should perish. Yes, but that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. Does that sound like he said you're a devil? No, you're his children over here on this chart. Now, if I can get down here without falling. Yep, I am 73 now. So see, this word on this green chart, philoprogenitiveness. That means the, the love of the offspring by the parent. Philo means love. And your pro, progenitiveness, that means your offspring. And this is what Yahweh, he is our mother and he is our father, see. He's, he's, he's the all in all. Yahweh is the spirit, substance, source, and law, eternity. He's our heavenly father. And we should listen to him and not some man or some preacher on TV. Because right. they haven't had the vision. The vision. Yahweh said he was going to send a divine vision and revelation at the end of this age. And it's down here, folks. Dr. Kelly received that divine vision and revelation in the year of 1931. I can't even imagine it being in 1931. Mm -hmm. See? He was a, a black man in 1931, facing the whole world right. with what Yahweh gave him. Yahweh, it seems like an impossible task. Right. Just like when he sent Moses down to Pharaoh, yeah. and he said, you know, he's not going to let you go, but you tell him. What? Yeah. <laughs> I would not want that job. <laughs> you go down to Egypt and you go to the big guy, Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. But he's not gonna he's gonna be resistant. Yeah. 
Okay, it sounds like not fun. <laughs> See? But Yahweh is running it. He's running Pharaoh. He would harden his heart and then cause him to relent. And in the end, he said, go, get out of here and ask Yahweh to bless me too. Because Yahweh showed him who was boss. And, some, and he's got to show all of us who's boss. And we're down here fighting for our life. Fighting for our souls. Yeah. See? That's right. I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And I'm happy to see everybody's faces. And, and you know, just like the things that, that uh, Jimmy was writing on the board, if you couldn't see it here, get on YouTube <laughs> and look at it. You know, I think Julian probably zoomed in on it. Get on YouTube and, and write the... I'm going to watch it again and take more notes. Because yeah. th these lectures are so important because yeah. they're not from a man, they're from Yahweh. That's right. And I've watched other lectures. I was watching Joel Turner earl earlier this morning. He was going into some scientific... I just... Yahweh knows how to draw us. Yes. He gives us food for thought. Yeah. See, I've heard that before, but it means something different now. Yeah. But, you know, I'm going to take my seat because I'm, I'm thankful to be here. Thankful to Yahshua that you guys are here. And I'm praying that Yahweh will keep all of us. Keep all of us. And, and please, Jimmy, please give us some more what Yahweh has given you. Because it's beautiful. And uh, there was a transcript that uh, Joel Turner referenced. I think it was like the altar of incense. In there, Dr. Kinley said that even the ministers in the school were foreordained from the foundation of the world. Yahweh's given the message to be put out. See, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful because my little pea brain, you know, Yahweh has put up with me. I remember Dr. Kinley called me a little upstart. <laughs> and I thought I was insulted. But I, you know, you ought to be glad to be an upstart, and not a dead plant. <laughs> I didn't have sense enough to realize what he was saying. But you know, it's just wonderful. I, I just love to share some of these experiences. But we're out of time. I all praise be to Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. I would try to take this off, but I couldn't get it.
was coming.
Thank you, Dr. Rosemary Turner. We praise Joshua for a beautiful class teaching coming through through these vessels. Now at this time, we'd like to cordially invite our visitors and friends to please return here and study with us. Classes are held on Tuesday and Thursday evenings from 7.30 p.m. until 9.30 p.m. and on Sundays from 11 o'clock a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m at 308 Montgomery Avenue here in Springfield. Now please, class, would you please stand to be led in benediction, taken from the last two verses of the Book of Jude, Holy Name Version. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah our Sovereign, Belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.